organization called and I see it at the University of Chicago. And I'm also an Our Lady Seattle co-organizer and try to be very active on, in the art community on Twitter. Um, follow me at ivlf3. Thank you so much for talking about my blog. I also really enjoy uh, writing uh, tutorials and tips and tricks about R. And I'm so excited today to talk to you about tables. So the agenda for today will be introducing tables, what they are and why we should uh, consider them as a tool for communicating information and what principles we can apply when we create tables. Then we'll shift uh, to talking about creating tables with R and uh, the many, many options that are available. And finally, we'll go into a tutorial where we will create uh, tables using one of the packages called GT. And so GT is a package that uses a cohesive set of table parts to create really beautiful looking tables. And it has many extensions and many features. It's a really great package, uh, especially if you're used to the tidyverse way of writing with R and the uh, MacReader pipe. And then also everything is available on GitHub. Uh, I've provided all of the code as a project on RStudio Cloud as well. If you would rather use that to follow along doing the tutorial, or if you'd rather use uh, the GitHub repo, um, if you're able to fork and clone the, the repo from there. And so if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat. If there's anything immediate, your co uh, wonderful co-organizers will let me know. Um, anything else, if you want to raise it for discussion, we'll leave some time at the end. And uh, I, we already started this, um, but throughout the chat, or sorry, throughout the talk, I will be posing some questions for you to answer in the chat. And I really welcome your participation uh, in these types of questions. Um, and uh, I'll be sure to ask for the chat to see what you wrote afterwards. Um, so to start off, uh, let me know where you're joining from, if you haven't already. <laughs> And full disclosure, one of the reasons I am most excited to talk today about tables is that our studio is having a table contest. So from now until November 15th, uh, you can submit a table and you know, this contest is open to pros and beginners alike. And uh, it's just an opportunity to showcase the skills that you have and um, anything that you may learn from the GT package today. And I highly recommend that you submit, it's a lot of fun. So to start off, let's begin with the basics. Uh, what is a table? Ta-da! Okay. <laughs> so you may have seen that coming, a joke, uh, but it is noting, worth noting that there are many types of tables and specifically in the data world, uh, for example, there is the Humble Spreadsheet, which is a commonly used tool. Um, there are relational database or tables as used in a database. And there are also console tables that print out information on your data, like tallies or summary statistics, just write in your IDE. But today we'll be talking about a, a type of table that is used as a data visualization tool. So it presents information in a tabular format, visual way, um, but it uh, goes a step further beyond these types of tables. But going back to the joke, how is a table like a table? So generally they have some similar type of structure with a top and legs, or in this case, a single leg, but there can be some variation. Uh, there are many styles of tables. They can be ornate or they can be simple. And they can be used in various settings, uh, like in the dining room or in the office or outside. But the most important thing is that a table is well-designed and functional. And similarly, tables for data visualization um, have corresponding qualities. They are usually made up of rows and columns that contain information, so uh, some sort of structure. Uh, there are very straightforward tables, such as in spreadsheets, or incredibly complex ones that have colors and visualizations and images embedded. And they can be used for many reasons, uh, but they also need to be well-designed and functional. 
So like with furniture tables, these aren't the only things that define table as a data visualization tool. And we'll dig in a bit more about what usually makes up tables, but I hope this gives a good starting off point. So why do we use tables? <laughs> uh, we know what a table consists of, but why would you use that as opposed to a bar chart or a line graph or something like that? And so to explain, I'm going to adapt the story that was the inspiration for the theme today uh, from my wonderful friend, Ryan Estrellado. Uh, Ryan tells inspiring stories about using data, and he has an upcoming book called the K-12 Educator uh, Data Guidebook. And he uses these stories to explain how and why we should apply data concepts to a work, and um, especially for those in education. So just take a moment and imagine it's summer and you're at the airport, just past the security check. You turn around and see a line of people, faces blank as they load shoes and belts and laptops into scuffed gray plastic bins. You phase forward again and look out at uh, walkways, busy with travelers, some casually rolling their luggage and others speed walking to the next gate. You feel a nagging sense of urgency that you know will calm as soon as you locate two key pieces of information, the gate where your plane departs and the starting time for boarding. Off to the right, you see a large monitor. You walk over, look up and see this. Wait, what? Probably not what you were expecting. <laughs> uh, sure, it has gates and departures and destinations, but while a map like this does help convey information, it's not the most useful or appropriate for the setting. To answer the question why you use tables, it's because it's the best way of conveying information that you need to convey in that particular time and place. So in the chat, uh, do you have any examples of when you decided to display a table as opposed to you know, using a chart or anything like that? Um, yeah, welcome your thoughts and I'll take a quick look. Descriptive statistics, summary data, hypothesis test outcomes, Definitely. Sometimes you just need to be able to read it. Interest rates over time with a level of precision hard to see in a chart, model results, model outcomes. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you so much. So, like many of you alluded to, charts use abstraction to focus on things like trends. They can effectively communicate broad analytical concepts very quickly, but that means that they sacrifice granularity and the depth of detail that sometimes is necessary. So in the instance of this data visualization uh, for the map, you can see how many flights leave Johannesburg and approximately where they're going, but it doesn't really work when at that moment in time we need to know our gates and our departure time. Whereas tables are meant to be read, so they're more ideal when you're looking for really specific information, like your flight gate and departure time. And so they're also better for comparing to exact values. And also tables are able to incorporate qualitative data and um, provide multiple dimensions that might clutter a data visualization. So all this to say, if sometimes you're finding yourself struggling to convey what your data is telling you in a chart or a graph, you can ask yourself a few questions and see if a table might be the solution. So like, are you hoping that your readers look at individual data points or patterns and trends? Uh, will your reader be uh, comparing two data points together? And can they do that more easily if they can read the exact values? And how much time does your reader have to actually understand the data? If they need the answer very quickly, say they're running to catch their plane, they might not want to look at a chart and then to a legend and then back to the chart. Uh, they just might not have that time. So maybe you also want your readers to be able to sort and look at uh, different cuts of the data fairly quickly. And again, if you have qualitative data that you want to include to provide more context, perhaps a table could be your solution. And so thinking through these sorts of questions can help determine if a table is the right way to convey 
uh, the information that you're looking to convey. So back to Ryan's book, he concludes his journey through the airport. He says, the monitor shows numbers and words neatly stored in uniformly sized boxes. The way that your eyes scan from the top to the bottom before landing on the name of your destination city feels automatic on account of the alphabetical ordering. Your eyes change direction and start traveling left to right and then land on the number of the gate that you'll be departing from. And finally, your eyes wander a few more inches to the right, settling on the time that your plane leaves. So to just sum up, when done well, data tables can organize numbers and words so that people can efficiently compare and make associations along rows and columns. And th so they can be elegant solutions to our data communication needs. Okay, I just spent a lot of time talking about how wonderful tables are, but why not both? Uh, it is important to note that tables and charts are not mutually exclusive. Uh, they're both visual media, and they can be effectively used together to reinforce the statement that you're hoping to make. Combining the two can actually bring the advantages of both approaches. So here are a few examples that illustrate the power of combining tables and charts. You can see that they uh, include embedding visualizations to actually changing the formats of tables to convey information. So in this example, we have a forest plot so we can see the distribution of the data as well as very precise uh, values such as the p-value. Here's one, an example from the New York Times that I really enjoyed. So in addition to having the table that, uh, that illustrates numbers, they also overlaid the bubble chart or bubble that the size also conveys the, the uh, size of the number. And then as well as images of the, um, of the different people so that we can kind of get a sense of what they look like. And then also another visualization that uh, gives even more context to the numbers below on the table. And then in this particular one, they um, actually like combine the table with a sort of div the visualization to show the pattern of um, what things look like over time, but then also giving the reader the information that they need if they need to know the exact um, precise uh, number that they're looking for. So finally, in conclusion, uh, in case you need further proof that sometimes tables are the right way of communicating information, I'll also link to a fascinating Medium article um, that, about visual communication that discusses my most favorite table, which is the periodic table of the elements, in which the constructor of the table, Dmitry Mendeleev, tried various ways of writing out the elements and ultimately decided that a table was the way to go. And uh, he is quoted as to have saying in a dream, a table where all the elements fell into place as required. Awakening, I immediately wrote it down on a piece of paper. So all this to say, uh, what matters is your readers, your contacts, and your goals to decide if a table is the right format for you. Also, take a second. Do you have any favorite tables? Um, feel free to share them in the chat. I would love to see uh, any any tables that you have enjoyed in the past. Okay, I'll give you a second to search for them. Um, maybe come back to them at the end. But for now, we will talk about what makes a good table, so some principles about tables. Um, so in terms of this question, I, I definitely had to spend some time thinking about it, especially because not surprisingly, I'm going to say it very much depends on your audience, your data, your communication style, and so on. Uh, but I do think it is a good principle to, um, oh, I'm sorry, it's a good thing to look at others' principles and what they've adopted to consider how to uh, build your own tables and determine if they're the right design principles for you. So I, I just wanted to write out 
um, these examples of guidelines from uh, John Schwab, and he published a paper called 10 Guidelines for Better Tables, in which he recommends these specific steps to improve your tables. So offsetting the heads um, and so on. And we'll walk through them together. And so my recommendation, again, when you are working on your tables, you can try these out and adapt them to come up with your own guidelines uh, that are particular to your project and to your workplace. And again, in the chat, if you have any particular uh, guidelines, I placed the, the slide too late, but um, let's go through these together first. So first, offsetting the heads from the body. Uh, this helps delineate you know, where the header begins, where the body is, and it makes it a little easier for your reader to understand the table. Another example is using dividers rather than heavy grid lines. And here, the gray shading is um, better to, uh, to point out what the average is. Otherwise, the, co the columns kind of all blend into each other. Right aligning numbers and heads. So in this example, having the numbers to the left versus um, in, this, or in the center versus the right uh, can make it a little bit uh, more difficult for your reader to be able to read the numbers. Uh, take a second, take a look and see if you agree. And then similarly for text and heads, that in some cases it is um, better to right align the text so that it is easier to read down the column. Um, but in the paper, he does mention that there are some cases where it makes sense to center. And so it's very much dependent on, you know, the style that you're going for, the data that you have and how you wanna communicate that. Another principle is uh, selecting the appropriate level of precision. And I feel like this is another example that depending on the context, it's up to you to decide what is the right level. In some cases, maybe it makes sense to have three or more decimals. And in some cases, it might make sense to have no decimals at all. And so depending on the data that you have and the information you want to convey, uh, just making sure that the level for your numbers are appropriate. And then, it, uh, another thing that the paper calls out is using appropriate level of spacing and um, making sure to guide the reader when they're reading the table in terms of the things that, um, you know, that you want to draw their attention to, what makes it easier to read, uh, perhaps like testing it out with folks and seeing uh, what seems to resonate with them with the information that you're trying to convey. Another uh, suggestion is to remove unit repetition. I, and so this is something that, again, depending on your own style, you might um, do it in various different ways, but really is uh, thinking about what you want the reader to focus on. Is it the numbers or is it the unit and how to best uh, organize your table to reflect that? Another suggestion is highlighting outliers. And so making sure that it's very clear, again, if there's a piece of information you want your reader to know, can you make it um, a little bit more obvious? Uh, can you draw their attention so that uh, they know exactly what you're trying to convey with the data? And then uh, uh, this is similar to the other guideline, but just in terms of how you group data and so if it makes sense to um to re avoid repetition say in this particular example with the region and just having um the region listed once versus the countries each listed individually just thinking through those different design decisions that will help your reader uh, understand your table and then finally uh, alluding to what we mentioned in the last section Sometimes uh, visualization is uh, appropriate and it helps convey your information in a more clear and direct way. And so uh, also considering the kind of merging of the two approaches whenever you're uh, designing a table. And so this is the slide I was looking for before, but if there are any other guidelines that you like to use when you're, um, when you're developing tables, 
please let us know. I think a part of this talk is really trying to reinforce the fact that this is a learning process. It's very much dependent on the context and the, whatever makes sense for um, the readers that you have and the uh, uh, situation in which that you are portraying data. And then in addition to scanning other people's guidelines, another thing I really like to do is look at other people's tables, uh, such as past submissions to the RCA table contest, um, or any of the ones that you uh, share in the chat in terms of your favorite tables to see lessons that I can take and apply in uh, future work. And so, for example, in developing this talk, I looked at a lot of flight monitors <laughs> and you know, thought through my own process as a traveler, the sort of information that, um, you know, that I wish I would see when I look at flight monitors and uh, how to present them in a way that makes the most sense when you're kind of in a rush and hungry and needing to get to your plane. Uh, and so uh, definitely consider other people's examples as a learning part of your learning process as well. So there's no right way to create a table, but it's always useful to take inspiration from others. So speaking of that, I've hopefully convinced you that tables are a viable way of creating visualizations and communicating information. And hopefully we can agree that a table is a better way of communicating flight departure information at an airport. So let's design a flight monitor that's a lot better than the map I created. Uh, let's ask yourself some questions first. So thinking about a flight departure table at an airport, what sort of information do you think is the most important to display? And let me know in the chat. And I'll leave it now. Times, uncertainty in times, delays. Destination. Gates and locations. Destination times gates. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Some of the things that I came up with is uh, travelers most likely know what airport they're in. Uh, they certainly know the airline, almost certainly know the airline, the city, and the name of the destination airport where they're going. They may know the flight number, um, and they maybe know the gate, but the gate may have changed since uh, they last checked. So uh, the latest information on that is important. They want to know what terminal they're in and what terminal the flight is in and whether they're the same. Uh, they know the expected departure time, um, most likely, um, but travelers probably also want to know if it's on time and delayed or canceled. So a lot of the um, information that uh, you have already mentioned, and if it has been delayed, they want to know what the new departure time is. Uh, travelers want to know if the flight has started boarding yet or if they have time to get to the gate. And they'll want to know what time it is right now so that they know if they're late. So now that we've thought of a few key data points, let's start making our table. So specifically tables in R, luckily there are many, many options for those who want to create a table. And so I actually post this to Twitter to see you know, what um, options people like to gravitate towards. And here are some of the uh, tables that they listen. There are many options. And as you can imagine, these packages all offer uh, different features that may better fit some projects and not really others. And so, and also if you know any other table packages, please let me know. Um, so some questions that you may want to ask yourself when you're deciding on a, a particular R package could be like, again, who's the audience of your table? If it's just you taking a preliminary look at your data, maybe a console table is, is good enough. If you're writing an article for the New York Times, you may want to create something that's very striking. 
And if it's for a statistical journal, you may want something that's very clear and straightforward. If they have a very specific format in which to submit the table, then you'll want to follow that format. And so depending on your answers to those questions, uh, then you can think about the technical aspects of these different packages and ask yourself, how easily can these tools be used to produce what you need? Um, do you need conditional formatting, colors, visualizations? What's the output of your table? Like, it, do you need to be able to insert it in a Word document or will HTML work as well? Thinking through these questions, uh, I had to decide on a table package uh, for the presentation today. And I wanted to make sure to choose a package that could help me show you different steps in creating tables. Because of that, I decided to go with the GT package. So GT is an amazing package. It helps you construct a variety of useful tables using these sorts of parts of, um, of the table. And so an example of the part is the table header, the stub, the column labels and spanners, uh, things like that. And in terms of a typical workflow, it's taking uh, your data frame and converting it into a GT table, modifying it with various GT functions, and then outputting it. And in terms of output, you do have several options in GT like HTML or a PNG. So today we'll be going through a table and slowly adding layers for everything that we want to see. And as we go through, you may be wondering like what, what it all is possible. And I will just say the GT package is really, really powerful. Um, I think of it as having four main components, which are the table parts, which I just mentioned, like the header, the stub, footnotes, et cetera. Um, there's also cell styling. So for any particular cell, uh, you can highlight them, you could add colors, add borders for each of the specific cells. Then there's also the table options. So that's the things that apply to the whole table. So things like making the header a certain color or uh, increasing the width of a table, things like that. And then finally, there's the actual content. Uh, so GT has functions for adding number formatting. So if the column has a percentage, adding the percentage sign, um, even inserting images or visualizations. So all this to say GT is very powerful and could do many things. So what I recommend is imagining what you would like to see in the design of your table, and then uh, going through the steps to add it to your table, your GT table based on those four components. From now on, uh, you can follow along in the code if you'd like, or if you want to jump into running the tutorial, you can uh, do so on RStudio Cloud, or again, fork and clone the repository. And uh, just really quickly, this is, I will show you what RStudio Cloud looks like. Um, and if you do uh, end up running the code, I just highly recommend like playing around, uh, change a value, rerun the table, see what it looks like. and um, you know, to, as a, to get a sense of like the sorts of things that are possible with uh, GT. And so this is what it looks like uh, if you do end up running the code either here or on your own uh, computer, you can uh, run each chunk just like I will. Um, and the RStudio Cloud, these uh, packages should already be installed. Here's a nifty function for adding your name. So if you want to play around with your table, it will save it uh, with your name specifically. And uh, one other cool thing that I recently learned is if you see here, um, inline chunk output type means that the uh, table will be outputted right underneath the code chunk. If you would rather it be outputted out here, you can go to this little settings, click it, and then say chunk output in console. And so that way the table shows up um, in your viewer pane as opposed to underneath the code check. So really it's up to you and uh, your, your preference. So I'll just give everybody a second, uh, depending on what you'd like, but if not, I will open it up in my own R studio. And loot my libraries. So let's start by looking at our data. Great. 
So this data comes from a website called openflights.org. And I will say the sourcing and the cleaning of this data came entirely from a really amazing tutorial by Francisco Requena on exploring world flights using a network approach. And I really highly recommend this tutorial if you just uh, also want to learn about network analysis from a variety of angles. And in addition to the data from the tutorial, I also created some fake data for today, but left the uh, rest of the data set so we could walk through our thought process for creating a flight departure table. And so when we look at the data, we see that there's some helpful information like uh, name of city, um, name of airport, but there are also a bunch of columns that we don't need. Uh, for example, we mentioned that uh, a traveler might already know what airport they're in. So having the name of the airport uh, in the table itself might not add that much information. And we also have the destination airport continent. Oh, continent, there we go. Um, <laughs> that probably won't add that much information as well. And there's also a variety of different columns, as you can see, that uh, provide both the source and the destination airport information, like latitude and longitude and things like that, um, clusters. So this came from the analysis itself. So a bunch of things that we probably don't actually need. Um, and there is a column that I created that's called time before departure. Uh, which is probably not one that you'd see in the real life airport, but we're going to keep for the purposes of this demonstration. And so I am going to go back here. So here we actually see the destination airport code. So I love your thoughts. Should we keep or remove that column for the destination airport code? Let me know what you think and why in the chat. So yes, many people know the code. Are we on your ticket? So a couple of yeses. And I say, like, honestly, I went back and forth on this a few times. And ultimately, I decided, yes, to, to keep the column. And the reason that I decided to do that was um, because some cities have multiple airports. And so if, if we only keep the city name, we uh, the, the traveler might not actually know which, which airport it is going to. And the reason I was kind of like hesitating is because, oh, what if it is redundant if for any particular city that only has one airport code? And then also a traveler might not necessarily know because um, airport codes don't always correspond with the airport name or the city, uh, like uh, OR Tombo has J and B. And so it might not be the most straightforward, but like I mentioned before, uh, I took a look at many, many real airport departure monitors and I actually saw an example where they kept it just for cities that had multiple airports like New York. And I thought uh, this was the design that I liked the most because it gives the information uh, that oh, people might not even realize that they need. And so ultimately, again, it is up to you to decide the best design choices and the best approach. So here we are going to select only the columns that we're going to be using for our table and then arranging it by alphabetical order by city. Oh, and I would say like that was another design choice uh, that I um, ultimately decided to make uh, in terms of like what should be in the leftmost column and what should be you know, the first reference. And so I, I would say like, this is very much thinking about English speaking populations that read from left to right. Uh, again, the context is so important, but if you have thoughts on um, other information that maybe should have been in the leftmost column, uh, let me know. 
And I would say too, the, some of the other examples that I uh, saw had time in the leftmost column. And I thought that was interesting because I, um, you know, recognize like a lot of folks know the time that their flight is leaving, but what would happen if the flight changed and um, the time changed and how would that show up on the table? I'm not quite sure. And so then uh, ultimately I went through the same process with the other columns to decide the, the order that they should be in. Okay, so with that and clean data, the columns that we need and the arrangement that we need, we can get started creating our GT table. And so to get started, you pipe the data into a GT. So if you're following along, oops, sorry, I guess I should create this or this data set first. So ta-da, um, we are getting started. We have our first uh, GT table. And so you can see the default format of what it looks like and um, generally what it looks. So it takes your data frame and converts it into the GT style. So let's start from the top. Let's add a title. So if you were to look back on the table parts that I mentioned, title and subtitle are listed under tab headers. And so we pipe in a tab header and specify the title uh, that we want and the subtitle that we want. So now we see it show up in our GT table, which is great. But taking a look at it, uh, departures is really, really small. And your traveler might want to know, you know, am I looking at an arrivals table or a departure table? And so one nifty thing about GT is you can actually add HTML directly into the, um, into the uh, le levels of text. And so for example, here in subtitle, we can specify HTML and then the font size and strong uh, just directly here. And so if we were to run that, you can see that it shows up in your table. And it, you may have noticed already that this is kind of just a layering of different attributes that we want to see in our table. So we started with uh, the basic table, we added a title, now we added a subtitle with uh, HTML. So this one is a little bit more, um, a little bit more complex, but it mentions how GT takes the data that you've provided it uh, to, to actually render the table. And so if you take a look at this table, it's actually very, very long, uh, very long. And let's say we wanted to specify um, in, uh, equally sized chunks of the table that we want to present to our travelers. And so because we are working in R, we can actually let R, uh, let the R know which for the data frame, the different chunks that we want and then pipe that into our GT table to actually render it in the table. So uh, what I mean to say is we're going to create a column using mutate that creates a column called page that equally divides the data frame into three. And so then from there, we're going to pipe those groups into GT by specifying group name call and saying that uh, we're going to use the page that we just created to, um, to chunk out the, the table. And so if you were to run this, you will see it show up. Now we have this, uh, this, this um, divider for, that is based on the number and grouped by um, that number that we just created in the data frame. And so for, uh, all of group one is listed here. All of group two is listed here. And then all of group three is listed here. And so you could imagine, say, that you wanted to create a table that was grouped by a uh, continent. If you had a column that specified the continent, you could have piped that into the GT table, say, um, the various different continents, and then uh, it will create these dividers, um, you know, same with Africa, Australia, Europe, et cetera. Uh, 
So next up, we're going to add a spanner. So uh, because GT has so many different kind of levels, uh, this one came up because say your traveler doesn't know what terminal they're in and they are interested in knowing, are they in the same terminal as their flight or are they in a different one? And so by adding a spanner, you can add a label to it saying you're in terminal one. And then you let it know, uh, let GT know which columns you want the spanner to, to span. Uh, in this case, I specified uh, column four all the way to the last column. And so if you were to run that, now you can see that there is a table spanner here that spans from the fourth column all the way to the end, letting the uh, traveler know that they are in terminal A. Uh, if you were to span it, say, from the fifth column, you could imagine that you would just change this from four to five and rerun it. Ta-da. So let us say that the traveler is very jet lag and, and is not aware of what uh, day it is or time it is. And we wanted to add a node at the bottom of the table letting them know. And so another uh, table um, part that GT allows you to edit is the sources and the footnotes, et cetera. Uh, here, we're going to add a source note by piping in tab source note with the information that we want to let the traveler know. So since it's a source, it'll be all the way at the bottom. There we go. Now the traveler is aware of what day it is and what time it is. So if we look at our table, oops, sorry. we see that we still have the original uh, column names for from the data frame. And while useful to us, it might not be as useful to somebody who, you know, it's not aware of what those, um, those names mean. And so you do have the option of editing it within your data frame, but say your call or your variable names are something that are really useful for you. They're much easier to type and you don't want to change the data frame itself. You just want it reflected in the table with GT that you can do that as well. So we can edit the column headers uh, by piping in calls label. And then for each of the column names, specifying uh, what we would like it to show up as and the variable name as well. So city.y becomes two. And this is kind of similar to the rename function in dplyr, except uh, it's re reversed. The variable name is uh, on the left. But what you want to change it to is actually on the right. <laughs> and so looking back at our table as well, we see that terminal and gate are usually pieces of information that are linked together uh, that we want to know. Uh, but terminal is aligned all the way to the left. Let's say that we want to align it to the right so that it's closer to gate and easier for folks to read. And so you can actually, um, in GT, uh, just align full columns by doing this. So piping in calls align, we say we want to align to the right and we want terminal to be aligned to the right. And because of the nature of uh, GT, say that you wanted to align multiple columns to the right, you could do so by, uh, by uh, creating a vector of column names here. So when we run that, we see the terminal is now going to the right and it's closer to gate and a bit easier to read together. So I mentioned earlier that uh, there are four main components and the first component are the various table parts. Uh, and then the second one that I mentioned was the cell styles. And so what that means is actually changing individual cells uh, to look the way that you want them to look. And so in GT, you can do that as well. And so let's uh, break this down a little bit. So the way that you edit cells is using this uh, called tab style, and then saying what style you're looking for. So in this case, we're saying that we want bolded text, 
and uh, this color of text, and then also specifying where we want to see those changes. So in this case, we're saying in the columns, uh, well, in this case, only one column terminal, we want to uh, change it to this style for any cell that matches uh, this condition, in which case the string detect in terminal and it contains the letter A. And so this is actually similar to this one in which we specify this style, which is uh, also bolded, but a different color. But this time we say that for the rows where terminal is equivalent to A. So that's just to show another example of uh, how conditional show up in cell styles. And then uh, just for another third example, we say tab style, uh, we want bold and we want this color. And we want it for any cells where in both columns, gate and terminal, where terminal is not equal to A, which is the current terminal that the uh, traveler is in. And so when you run this, you see it show up here. So uh, this orange A is reflected here. We're saying we want, we want a bolded orange for columns terminal where we saw an A. This uh, blue one is for in columns gate where the terminal was equal to A. And then all of the other gray ones were bold. And uh, this color in both the columns gate and terminal where the terminal was not equal to A. And so I also mentioned earlier that there are many, many options in GT and also a lot of extensions that people have built. And so one of my favorite ones is by Thomas Mock. It's called GT Extras. And uh, it was uh, one of the libraries that were listed up above. And so one of the cool things about GT Extra is that they, it allows you to stack various columns. So if we take a look here, uh, like we mentioned before, code is a little bit redundant with city just because um, some cities only have one airport and so don't really need the code but it's still a very useful information um, to share with our travelers. And so with GT extras, there is a function that allows you to stack these two columns so that it takes up less space, but still conveys the same amount of information. And it is like the other pieces of the GT table, Python GT merge stack. And we're saying we want column one to be the city and column two to be the destination to stack them together. And now you can see what that looks like. Which I think looks pretty nice. And so nice, I actually uh, decided to use it twice and this time using status and delayed time and stacking them together. So again, you can see GT merge stack, status and delayed time. And there's how it shows up. And then another cool function from GT Extras that I wanted to highlight was adding a bar chart. And so, like I mentioned earlier, sometimes it makes sense to have tables and visualizations together. And so GT Extras is a package that allows you to do that. And so uh, this is the function that you, again, would pipe into your GT table saying, um, you know, create a bar chart from this uh, numeric column. And so in this case, we decided to do time before the part, which is uh, the column that I kept earlier today, and then the fill in the background and scaled, uh, scales it to 100% if you so choose. And in this case, I just picked false. So running there, now you see this column has become a, a visualization of a bar plot. And so finally, uh, like I mentioned, this is very much a layering process. You will start with a basic table and start going through adding the different, uh, you know, factions that you'd like to showcase, uh, features, et cetera, editing the time um, to, like if I were to go back, I would some, uh, delete like the seconds because that is, you know, information that the traveler probably doesn't need. Uh, and so, going through the four components of the table part, the cell styling, 
and um, and the table options. Now we are going to move on to that third one. And so let's say that this particular table, it, it seems just a little uh, narrow and we kind of want to widen it up. So if you were to look at all of the table options for GT, there is so much. <laughs> there is uh, um, uh, editing the size, editing the individual cell sizes, uh, actually, maybe I'll just open it just so you can see like how many options there are for editing your table in GT. Like whether you want to align things, the header, et cetera. So uh, all this to say, there's a lot that you can do. Uh, but in this case, we just want to make the table a little bit wider. So running that, now we see it is a wider table. Maybe a little bit easier to read if we were to print it out. And so just finishing up um, in terms of uh, the styling, say, you know, you want to add colors, you want to add colors to some places and not others. Uh, GT allows you to do that through this kind of layering process. And so this particular styling, I um, uh, used somebody's really great reference and just started slowly adding, you know, the colors that I wanted, the weight that I wanted, the cells that I wanted it to show up. Uh, just to kind of finish up the, the look for this particular table. So if you were to go back and see the reference, all the colors would match according to the, the different tab stylings, et cetera, that we edited. And just to finish off, like I mentioned earlier, uh, in GT, you can actually um, save your table in a variety of formats using this function called GT save. And like with all the other pieces, you pipe it in and let uh, the, the tape or let R know where you want to save the table, what format. So in this case, it's HTML. You could change it to PNG. And as you can imagine, it would save that exact table in that folder. And finally, I, I just wanted to mention, I can't mention GT without also mentioning this other package called GT summary. And particularly if you do a lot of research or you know, want to produce summary tables that are really nice to present to uh, other, other readers, GT summary helps you do those kind of calculations directly um, with your GT table uh, since it's built on GTs. And so for example, it, let's say you are interested in analyzing these data and you want to see which particular terminal seems to do better in terms of delays and cancellations, you can use GT and create a, a table that looks like this. So you can see for A, how many canceled, how many uh, on time, and doing that directly with the package as opposed to you know, calculating it in the data frame and then piping it into a table. All right, thank you so much for uh, joining me on this GT adventure. Uh, I hope that it was helpful in showcasing uh, how you start off with GT, how you layer in the different options and ultimately come up with a beautiful visualization. And I really appreciate the chance to go around the world with you in, uh, with this table. And so with that, um, I will stop sharing and see if there are any questions. Thank you so much. That was really cool. Thank you. If anyone has any question, you're welcome to unmute as well and ask them. Awesome. Well, uh, if not, like the presentation, the code, everything will remain on the uh, GitHub repository for um, for you to take a look at at any point. Oh, Emmanuel. Yeah, sorry. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the very great presentation. It's very interesting. Uh, my question is, uh, is it possible to paginate tables in GT tables, something like having multiple pages? I've tried to check the documentation online, but I didn't find so much. 
I believe that you can. I can double check though and um, maybe reach out to your co-organizers to, to let you know. I, but I think, I think using like the pipe, one should probably be able to, to do that um, and save them separately. Oh, okay. So what do you mean by save them separately? Like having different HTML files? Yeah, is that what you're asking? Like to see if um, like one particular data frame, maybe like using that kind of chunking uh, function that I mentioned earlier with the different groups, I think that can be piped into how you save the table as well. But I can um, find out and, and confirm. If I can follow up on that. So I mean, so let's say I've got 200 rows, rows and I want to display 10 rows per time. So let's say page one with 10 rows then page two with another 10 rows, um, and then page three, something like that. <laughs> yeah, I, again, my inclination is to say that it's possible, but I will uh, double check. And if it's not, I'll also let you know. Okay, thank you so much. Don't know if anyone else has any other questions, um, but we do encourage everyone to try and enter the table contest. So it's, I think the deadline is the 15th of November. That's right. Yes, we'd love to see your submissions. Yes. <laughs> what are the, what are the um, criteria? What is the, or the aim of the competition? Uh, in terms of, the article definitely like says more specifically, but it doesn't have to be GT, it could be any table created in R, uh, it could be static tables or interactive tables. Um, really, uh, just if there is a particularly interesting data set that you want to showcase, feel free to mm -hmm. submit. I see um, two people arrived late. I'm sorry, um, but we, we are recording, so we'll we'll share that with you so you can catch up. Katie and I think and I think Sipe. Cool. If no one has anything else, um, we'll end our meetup. It was very nice to have everyone here. Thank you again, Isabella. And yes, please uh, uh, tag us if you do come up with something for the table contest, we'd love to see. And do join us on our meetups in future as well. We love seeing you all here. And thanks for joining us. Well, thank you all so much. <laughs> I see there's a question from Juan. It's quite interesting. Is it possible to use markdown writing in a table? So I suppose this, so can you add, add LaTeX and that sort of thing in there? And also traditional markdown. Katie, I see you not in your head. <laughs> uh, do you have an answer? I, yeah. I no, I don't. Oh, Katie. <laughs> yes. Um, yes, you can, um, you can add formatting. Um, let me think off the top of my head. I know you can do, I know you can do HTML formatting. Um, and Isabella, you may have already gone through that. Mm. Um, and I think, what is the command to, um, I think there's a helper function within GT. I'm not sure. I, I know you can do H, uh, sorry, markdown formatting as well. Markdown formatting. Um, and I think LaTeX is in progress, if I, Okay. Very cool. So on Tuesday, very, very soon, so in six days time, we're going to have another meetup um, on SF networks. If anyone, so a bit of spatial stuff and SF networks and um, how to, um, bringing networks from OpenStreetMaps and that sort of thing. So everyone must just please look out for our next advertisement. We'll put it up. I'm gonna, for Bash, I'm gonna say tomorrow, but I think we'll do it tomorrow. <laughs> Putting us both under pressure now, but it's on Tuesday, please. So um, look out for it and you're all very welcome to, to join us.
on Tuesday again. Thank you again. Really appreciate the opportunity. Feel free to reach out, um, Manuel. I'll get back to you. And yeah, thanks so much. Thank you, Isabella. Bye.